Hello, I'm your host, Leonard Duncan. Welcome to a new episode of ATV Talk and Motorsports Podcast. Please join us every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We bring you interviews with industry professionals, live events, live news about the motorsports industry in every episode. Enjoy the show. Whether we are out riding with our friends and family or racing in extreme environments, we all need good tires. That's why I recommend GBC Power Sports Tires, a division of Green Ball Corp. Their products, which include XC Master, Mini Master, and Ground Buster 3, are what leading professionals in the ATV UTV industry are using. You can get your tires at greenballtires.com or find them on Instagram as GBC Tires for further inquiries. Casey Greek, how are you, brother? Good. Happy to be here. Uh, excited to get into this and dig, you know, into my background and what is all going on in the future here. Well, I, I appreciate you taking some time to come on ATV Talk. I know how busy you are. I mean, you're probably all over the planet all the time. Uh, or or at work like the rest of us. Yeah, it seems like uh, race season got over, and you know I was really excited for a little break, but it's been nonstop and just you know one thing after another with Quad Cross Nations and you know the Wavos race, and you know Tim Dentling's getting married soon, so we're going to go to Cancun for his wedding, and just been one thing after another. But it's been uh, exciting off season for me, and excited for next year. Yeah, I I think next year is going to be action packed. You know, there's there's so many different dynamics. I want to get into that and, and get your opinion on some things. But first, how did you find ATVs? Uh, really, I come from. I had a little tri zinger when I was young. It was actually my first motorized vehicle, you would say, and then I went straight into dirt bikes from there. And then dirt bike racing brought me in a weird way to ATV racing. One of my best friends and my best friend still now growing up is Richie Owens. So Steve Owens is his dad and they raced or he raced flat track. Richie was really good on dirt bikes and was really good friends. Steve and Corey Ellis were really good friends. So between those two, they got Richie to start riding. And he did some of the Mickey Thompson like indoor stuff back when that was going around, you know, in Southern California. And realized that he was good on a quad, but he was also really good on dirt bike. And so he ended up going the dirt bike path. And I was his mechanic for quite a, I don't know, three, four years, five years, maybe. We worked together, and which introduced me to Corey. And that's how I met Corey. And Corey's the one that got me my first job as a ATV mechanic at Suzuki. Nice. So it's off-road's kind of been in, in your life all along. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, as a professional, I think this is year 25. So, uh, you know, being paid to be in the industry, whether it's in, you know, from suspension to mechanicing to, you know, track building, I've been around it for 25 years now in that sense. But really, it started for me at a really young age, back in probably five, six years old, just getting, you know, into some ATVs and dirt bikes. And then really for me, the mechanic side of it started about nine, 10 years old. There was an old Harley Sportster in a basket in the back shed. My dad said, well, that's your Harley. When you put it together, you can have it. And so we just started from there and just started putting it together. And I just went out there, you know, after school and just tinkering around like a kid would and kind of built the thing complete, had it up and running. And, you know, we got into some hard times. We didn't grow very wealthy. We come from pretty much the dirt, you know, just as, as poor as you can get in some senses. And, you know, we always had food and, and things like that. We never did without, but we weren't getting luxury things or, you know, having, I wouldn't go on racing by any means. And so I put that together. We got into some hard times. My dad sold it. And as I got older, the love for the racing side of it and, and motorsports in general just never went away. I can remember watching just old VHS tapes you know, different races and different things I could get my hands on. And like, you know, a lot of kids watched <laughs> scrambled certain things on TV. I watched scrambled racing on TV, drag racing, whatever it was, anything that had a motor and was going fast, I was into it. And 
it just it's never stopped. I mean, still to today, you know, I'm still watching videos constantly. Obviously, yeah, races nonstop. So, you know, being from Southern California, that was like the mecca of all meccas, you know, for so many years of in in motorsports and in general. Yeah, it. There's still a lot going on, and there's still a lot of people here in Southern California. But the racing has moved as as the growth of the state, you know, and the, and the population got bigger and bigger. We lose tracks and we lose, lose riding areas all the time. So yeah, it's just, it is, it's, uh, not dying, but it's moving. Where do you yeah, think the hub is? Sorry, I didn't mean to step on you. Oh, you're good. Um, to answer you, I think really Florida, Florida and Charlotte, I would say is probably your two biggest racing hubs nowadays. Yeah, at least in my eyes and you know i live in this little bubble of atv racing nowadays i, I still follow supercross and motorcross motocross very closely formula one and then i kind of don't really follow the nascar thing all that deep and and some of the truck racing i do follow but just not as intense as say supercross motocross and atv racing obviously so the hub for you in ATVs is in Florida and North Carolina. Oh, for ATVs. I mean, for, for me, for our shop, we're in Ohio and I live in North Carolina. So I do a lot of travel and back and forth for that, but Florida really, you know, everyone goes down there in the winter and that's where everyone's riding. And, and you can pretty much go to any track that allows ATVs in the winter and find a good group of ATVs. We do have some really cool tracks here in North Carolina that allow us to ride all winter long. And we can get 20, 30 guys out there on a weekend. So it's always nice. And the weather here on this side, I'm on the eastern side, pretty close to the coast. The weather stays really well, really. I mean, it, it gets cold, but it's nothing like up north, say PA, or, you know, even going further up into Mass and stuff like that, where you're just buried in snow. Where if we get snow, it's like, the winter plague happened and it's really for less than 24 hours. <laughs> uh, if I get snow here, I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so means, it means I'm not leaving the house, uh, you know, cause it's, it, I, I just can't, I just can't deal with the cold. I, I'm a, I am a true Southern California, you know, warm weather. No, don't get, don't get me into the cold. Cause it's just, it's just no fun. Yeah. How did you go from Southern California to Ohio? Oh, man, I've been all over the country and, you know, different race teams and anyone that knows motorsports and knows when you're working for race teams and different, you know, manufacturers and different race teams in general, you're all over the place. So I've been, I was Southern California until I was probably 19, 20, moved to Vegas, worked for an off-road dirt bike team out there moved back to Southern California. And then we end up, I went to work for MotorWorks Can-Am in Lake Elsinore. And we moved our entire shop and everyone to Florida. And we had a cool little facility in Bronson, Florida. And we did that for a couple of years. And then we moved the entire facility back to Southern California. And so then we hubbed out of Southern California for another two years. And then I took a job leaving there to go work for uh, Bill Baird Motorsports with Lane Baird which is now he races pro-am and pro-sport and ATV motocross now. And so I went to work for him for a few years in Kentucky and kind of balanced between Kentucky and Indiana. They were right on the border, just basically a river that crossed. And when things kind of got slow in the steel industry for Bill, things kind of went awry and it didn't look like it was going to be real promising for Lane to continue racing for you know a long period of time. Bill kind of, you know, he was straight up with me he came to me as like the hugest thing that you could ever ask for or the biggest thing you could ever ask for in that situation and just said hey you know i don't think you're going to have a problem finding work but i think it's time that you look at something different you know i'm going to step away from racing and you know we're not real sure what lane's going to do next whether he's going to do side-by-side -side stuff which we had already went full bore into side-by-side -side stuff we raced you know king of the hammers did all sorts of ultra four events bunch of local events in Kentucky and Indiana, but it, we really didn't know where it was going to go. And funding was starting to 
you know, tighten up a little bit. And Bill came to me and said, Hey, look at, look at doing something different. And that's when I went to work for Jay Goble driving the Maxis truck to all the GNCCs and ATV motocross. So I went from, at that point I was living in Kentucky, had a house in Kentucky and, you know, we, we planted roots there. We planned on being there for a long time and, you know, things just didn't say work out in in that way, but it it all worked out in the end because that's what brought me to Jay and the tire truck and impact solutions and, you know, all the suits that I'm in now. And so eventually after I think a year, season, season and a half or so, I realized like we had to move closer to where our shop was, which was in West Virginia at the time. And so we moved into Ohio to into Marietta, Ohio, but it's the same thing. 15 minutes one way or the other, and you can be in Ohio or you can be in West Virginia. There's just a river that was in between the two. So we moved there, and then Jay ended up building a new facility and moved it over to Ohio. And that's where we are now. And then we got to the point with my family, my wife wanted to be by her mother. And her mother lives in North Carolina. So we moved to North Carolina and the shop is in Ohio and I go back and forth and, you know, I'll go there for three or four days and I come home for three or four days and travel and do that kind of stuff back and forth. And, you know, we're very fortunate. I got two guys in the shop full time. And then obviously Jay's there, you know, and between those guys and myself, I, I can pretty much manage everything we need to do over the phone when I'm not there and on the computer. So I just keep in the loop with those guys and we just stay in contact constantly and, you know, throughout the day, whatever it is. And I answer all the phone calls, emails, Facebook messages, Instagram, you know, whatever comes that way. So I just continue to be the voice in the face, even though I may not be technically at the shop with the communication that we have with those guys, we all kind of are in the same loop and we keep things rolling right along. Modern technology isn't that pretty amazing stuff, huh? Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, without these amazing phones and things that we have, it would never be possible to do it the way I'm doing it. And, you know, it definitely has its challenges without a doubt. I mean, it's a lot of time away from home. You know, it's a lot of time away from the shop also, which is huge. And, and uh, you know, at times a downfall. And sometimes, you know, you don't see the guys for a couple of weeks or whatever. and it makes it tough on everybody. They think you're just out, you know, goofing off and having fun. And everyone, you know, it's no secret. Everyone knows I love to fish. And so, <laughs> you know, I don't I don't get to fish as, nearly as much as I, I would like to. And I definitely don't fish during the week whatsoever. And, you know, when our prime fishing season, fortunately for us, is is really right now. Like, say you know, October, November, December, and then the end of January, middle of, to the middle of February is really the prime for saltwater offshore fishing on the East Coast, at least in, in our area. So that's a little bit of our downtime. So we do get to do some of that, but it's just balancing all of it together is sometimes pretty rough. So you, you uh, are fishing in the ocean. What are you fishing for? Um, you know, any of the plegic, you know, breeds or, you know, fish that you can imagine. I mean, really, in all honesty, let's face it, if if you want the harsh truth, anything that'll bite, just because, (laughs) you know, (laughs) we're not some, you know, crazy, you know, we don't get to fish enough to be able to go out there and target a species. So, you know, but we do, we do okay. We do a lot of Wahoo, um, dolphin or Mahi Mahi. Everyone's got a different name for them. That's kind of the the majority of what we're going after, you know, and then come into December, into January, then, you know, it's into yellowfin tuna and stuff like that. And I mean, trust me, if we catch a a good yellowfin tuna, you're going to know it because it's going to be blasted all over my social media because that's like a prize right there. You know, we'll be, we'll be coming to the races with sashimi. So, um, but you know, a good friend of mine, Chris Hunt, he helps uh, Michael Allred with Huntscapes, and he's got a boat here, real close to my house. We're 15 minutes from his boat. We go, and that's what makes it even possible is 
having Chris here and, and just the friendship and the time that we've developed and spent together out in the water has really kind of brought us to being really good friends. And it's the only reason I get to go offshore fishing. If it wasn't for him, I don't know enough people around here to go out and do that. I got a little boat, little 16 foot skiff that I fish like the intercoastal waterway and like the little creeks and rivers around here. But it's a whole nother game when you're 70, 80 miles offshore. Yeah, I don't, there's sharks out there. I'm not going, sorry. No, oh, there's sharks <laughs> on the inland waters. It's fine. It's okay, I'm we not swim going in those either. waters. <laughs> it's all good. I'm, I'm a water guy. I love it. I mean, we're, every weekend that I can be, we're on the water. Whether we're fishing or we're hanging out at sandbar. That's that. I know it's fun because I've done a little bit of it. I just, I am deathly afraid of sharks. That's yeah, like my one water. thing, but that's, but they're there in freshwater too. Nobody knows that they're in freshwater too. Bull sharks can live in both fresh and salt water. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the water around us, I mean, not to go completely off into that whole world, but a lot of the water around me, not when we get into the ocean, but the, the creeks, the ICW, the intercoastal waterway is what we call a brackish water. It has a salinity to it but it's not a high, high salinity to it. And gators can live in it too. So you got gators, sharks, stingrays, you know, you got all sorts of worries and concerns to go there. But typically, as I always say, they're a little more afraid of you than you are of them in most cases. And we're <laughs> fortunate they, they don't call us the Crystal Coast for no reason. You know, the water is pretty clear. And so, yeah. Knock on wood, I mean, heaven forbid, because my kids swim in it all the time, but we really don't see much, and there's usually a bunch of boats around. It's, it, I wouldn't say it's like Havasu by any means, because it's nowhere near, like, say, going to the sandbar at Havasu, where you have a thousand boats there, but there's usually, when we go park and hang out, you got another 30, 40 boats around, and everyone kind of hanging out, and people in the water, so it kind of keeps the wildlife away, I would say that's that's good that there's uh something to just detract from that and i like the fact that you have a hobby away from your chosen sport you know or or racing in general because i think it gives you a way to recharge your battery and and come back ready to go yeah and that's that's it exactly for me that you know between fishing and then just being out on the boat being out of the water you know that's my happy place not to say that the races are not my happy place but it's you know it, it is a job at the end of the day like we're there you know you've been doing this forever also and you get there and you, you got to do a job and you need a way to step away and take a breath and and go into the water whether we're just out cruising around driving you know floating down the waterway or parked at a sandbar so the kids can build sand castles and play on their boogie boards or 70, 80 miles out, you know, fishing in a thousand foot of water. As soon as I touch the water, it's like, okay, cool. Like uh, you can kind of take that break. And some days, you know, well, I mean, we've had 15 to 17 hour days out there. And then some days you put the, wa the boat on the water for 20, 30 minutes and that's all you needed. So it, it's good. That's awesome, though. I, I like the fact that you you have an outlet. M myself, I this is my life. Yeah. I wake I, up and do it. I go to sleep doing it. And um, that's just the way that uh, I've always done it. I mean, I have a couple other little hobbies, but, you know, they're they're hobbies that you do occasionally. And um, it, it's just ATVs, you know, working on I'm always working on something, you know. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> how this all came about, I don't know. I didn't think, I guess I, I guess I didn't think I had enough to do. So I wanted to start having this story told about the ATV industry. And here we are. Um, well, that, you're, you're doing a good job. I've watched, I'd say 99%, you know, of all your shows and, you know, even getting some of the guys that aren't technically just ATV based is really cool too. And I, you know, bringing those guys, cause you, you're educating them about our little world and some of those guys are bigger names and a lot bigger than say the atv industry in general so it's cool and you know they may already know 
or they may know nothing about it. And so getting those guys coming over and, and talking with you and getting to, you know, check it out and educate it, it it's going to be, it, it's only good for the sport and good for our industry. Yeah, that's why we changed to a motorsports podcast instead of just ATV talk, uh, because I want to diversify it. I want the people that have stepped away from ATVs that have went somewhere else, or maybe the people that know us, um, or just, you know, I reached out on social media to a couple people and they were interested and we had them on the show because what they were doing was really cool from, uh, salt, the, the salt flat racer to, uh, the, the, um, um, super bike gal. You know, that the, when you, if you watch her on social media, she's killing it. She's, she's jumped to a new machine. She's won some races and it, it's incredible to see the diversification in racing it, in motorsports itself. It, it's, it's awesome. You know, I talked to Rangel, um, he raced Vegas Torino on a 350X. Um, and you listen to that story. And it brings back so many three wheeler memories. I know that's a little before your time, but it's still such a huge portion of our industry that some of the four wheeler, the four wheeler kids of today don't even get it. They look at a three wheeler and scratch their head like, rode that? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, they're they're not making a what I would say an industry strong comeback, but there is a niche market for them and an enthusiast uh, game for it, and, and it's pretty cool. Uh, there's four or five, maybe six companies, strong companies that are that are doing it, and um, you could see them racing in different environments that we haven't seen for years. Um, th that's what I see happening, um, just because there's such a push for it. Yeah, but, it's, I'd say ahead. like the interest is is risen drastically. You know, I the, the manufacturing of ATVs or like the racing of ATVs when it was in its prime, I was really young. But I still are not ATVs, but ATCs or three wheelers, let's call it. Um, but I still rode them. I had them. I had a 200X and, you know, 200 r and we went through all that stuff as we were kind of riding because we didn't really race i didn't get to race until i was probably 15 16 years old because we didn't have really the means it was just like what came next we rode until it didn't ride no more and then we found something <laughs> else that we could ride and we that was just always the process that we had so rode a lot of three-wheelers but didn't get to see them race until the 40 the 47th 47th or 46th pine lake and I actually, I got a little overly lucky because I got to see Jimmy, Jimmy White ride an AT or a three-wheeler, um, Mark Baldwin, Shane Hitt. Uh, I think we even got Timmy Farr to go out on one. So I got a little spoiled because I got to see, you know, Jackie Meadows was there. Got to see a lot of the legends. Donnie Banks was there. And he even went out and took a couple laps on one too. So I was spoiled by getting, because I knew the history i knew the legacy and i know who all those guys are obviously so to see those guys and to know that's really where they came from and what they've developed in the sport and where they you know went to in the sport it was really really cool and iconic honestly yeah i think it's i think it's pretty awesome stuff um i get excited because i am such a fan you know when you get to go to events like that or you get to talk to people th that rolls me into uh the quad cross race that you got to go to the czech republic was that your first time going yeah that was my first time going and and, and honestly i was almost spiteful because i never got to go before like you know super jealous of the mechanics that went before and you know when i was wrenching full time we didn't we didn't go to that race and so i had never you know when it when it came about I was sort of out of the mechanic game and didn't didn't get to go. And I mean, plain and simple, if, if we would have had a team in 2011 and 12 and 10 and 9 and all those years, I probably would have went almost every year because we always had, you know, the riders I was working for. 
we're top three in points or, you know, winning races and we're on factory equipment and had the budgets and all that kind of stuff going on. So we would have went. And so, you know, we didn't ever go in those days and we got to go, you know, later on and I was doing something different, but I was still at the races. So I still seen it. It was still my friends and, and people I was, you know, deeply associated with going, but I never got to go. So when the phone call came this year, it was like instantly a no brainer. Uh, yep, not a problem. Whatever it takes, I'll be there. Uh, it was a huge honor for me to be able to go over there and and represent the country and to help, you know, Bryce. I mean, what an awesome experience for him as a young, you know, young pro. You know, he's only 20 years old. So I think he's one of the, I mean, he's the youngest American to ever go for sure, but he's one of the younger participants in that race. Yeah, it's it's huge. I got to talk to him uh, right after that uh, draw happened, where they where they picked those guys, and it's incredible. You could just tell it when you were speaking with him how excited he was about it, and uh, I think it was an excitement, a nerve, uh, an unknown, and so many other things going on in that poor little guy's head. You, you know. Yeah. And then you were firsthand, you were there with them and you were there with him. I got to watch it that day uh, when he won uh, his race. Um, I thought that was so great for him. You know, he was out there with Chad. Um, he didn't get the greatest start, but he drove his way back through the field. And then Chad went down and, and it was all on his shoulders to perform. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was tough luck for Chad, obviously. Um, you don't see very many failures. I mean, if you want to get exact, I think it's been two, two mechanical issues out of Chad Wheaton in the last like nine years or something. If we want to, if someone's counting. Right. Um, and so for that to happen, especially at that race, it was like, well, where's Chad? And then all of a sudden, you know, cause where, where, where Chad broke down at, it was right at the bottom of the hill where we couldn't see him. And we'd lose contact with the riders for us mechanics for about 25 seconds where you couldn't get a little, you know, a blip of their helmet or just to know that's your guy. And they're in that down back section of that track and they're gone. And it was all of a sudden Bryce comes over and first and I'm like, whoa, where's Chad? And then the radio just, you know, at that point, the radio is going crazy. Chad's out. He's on the inside of the corner, blah, blah, blah. And he's down here and he's looking at the back of the bike. So the first thing for me is like, okay, don't freak out, you know, obviously. And then it's just get Bryce to pace himself in the race. He's more than capable. His speed was incredible the entire time we were there and just keep his head on straight. And, you know, I I don't know how he says he didn't see the pit board because I damn near hit him with it like three or four times telling him he was <laughs> P1 and what his gap was. But, you know, he says that he wasn't even really sure where he was at. Like, he didn't really know. He thought Chad was just out front and he couldn't see Chad anymore. He never – he was in a battle passing for second in the corner before and the corner that Chad broke it. So he never seen the inside of that corner where Chad was at. And by the time he come around the next lap, they already had Chad's bike on the way back to the truck. So he never actually got to see, I think, Chad – broke down but which was almost in hindsight it's almost better that he didn't know because all he did was just go out there and do his thing and rode and you know obviously what an experience for him to be able to pull off that win in one of the main motos and come in such clutch for the team and put us in a in the position that we needed to be in going into the next motos of the day yeah, it, it was great. It was, it was a great confidence builder and, you know, just, just um, amazing. If you know the whole backstory behind everything and I don't even yeah. want to get into all that, but when you know all the deals that went on, it was awesome for that kid to get to experience that. And, you know, you're friends with him and you've worked with him and, and that probably made it even better for him to have you there. Uh, you know, as a, as a pillar of strength, you know, to just help guide him. Yeah. I mean, he had his whole, like say team there in a sense, because, you know, Mark Baldwin's a team manager. And then I've been a suspension guy off and on for years now. And, 
you know, we worked really closely together this year. And so I think for him, it just was just like another day besides I was the one spinning the wrenches on his bike. And Mark was the one standing at the top of the hill telling us what we were doing wrong. So usually it's the other way around. I get to stand in the tower and come back and tell them, hey, this is what's wrong or whatever it is. And so it it worked out perfect. I mean, it was smooth sailing for us the entire weekend. You know, um, Chad obviously had that one hiccup. Joel, another, you know, amazing performance out of him and just incredible for what <laughs> what we were all dealing with with sicknesses and and jet lags and all this other stuff, Joel was so under the weather, and to perform the way he did on Sunday was just incredible. I mean, it, it really shows the champion that he is. And you know, Bryce got the whole shot in the last moto, and Joel was second row. So you know, we all know the sa- the staggered start. Your one rider starts first row. Your second rider starts second mm-hmm. row. And they all have the flip flop, so they all have. It's all works out even, and just worked out to the to the way where Bryce got front row for the last moto. And honestly, I know how I was feeling, and I know how some of the other guys were feeling, and I know how Joel was feeling. And for him to be able to perform the way he did and have to come, you know, somewhat through the pack, I think he come out fourth, fifth, somewhere in there, and worked his way in, and just getting pelted. I mean, the rocks is like Unadilla, just you know, bigger than gravel size, but not like big chunk rocks. And they're just beating the crap out of you when you're going through all these riders and coming through and every little thing you did in the, in his position, he was hurting. And so just to man up and go through it. I mean, you can't say enough about him. And, you know, obviously Bryce knew exactly what he needed to do and racing with Joel wasn't one of the things that he needed to do. They needed to finish one, two, and however it worked out, whoever won whoever was second it didn't matter because that would secure the the world championship for us and then bringing that title back to the states and that was the number one fact and the and the reason that we were all over there to do and you know fortunately it got accomplished yeah it was it was great to watch uh, i mean there again I, i've said it and and all three of them rode really really well you know, unfortunately, Chad had that one mishap or you guys probably would have went one, two, one, two, one, two uh, for every moto. And uh, that that would have been an even stronger statement. But it, it was really good. Um, I got to talk to some of the or well, uh, Dean from uh, Ireland and um, Mark, I believe his name is. Mm hmm. Yeah, I got to. I didn't talk to Mark uh, verbally, but I got to text back and forth with him a little, um, and I try to get him on the show at some point. Um, but that was it, the the friendships that have been made and the growth for the whole sport because the Americans have went over there. I think is pretty incredible. Yeah, you know, I think we see a lot more international you know, flavor into the ATV motocross series. Now we're seeing more and more of those guys either showing interest or coming over and, and, and racing with us. And, you know, honestly, like Bryce said, he's like, I would love to come over there. You know, and we were there. He's like, I'd love to come over here and like race the series or, you know, at least hit a couple rounds or something like that. And, and Bryce is in that situation where he is capable and, and could go do that. He said like, he's like, I've never experienced anything like this. Like the fans were just incredible. The other riders, you know, and it's not that our fans aren't incredible. They're just so excited to see these guys where our fans they're they love seeing our guys, but they're just so accustomed to them. They're they're You're almost numb by who they are. And, and you get to see them every weekend or you get to see them every, you know, 10, 10 times a year. And you just kind of fall into that. Oh, there's Bryce or, Oh, there's Joel. Or there's Chad, but these guys don't ever get to see these guys, you know, the fans over in Europe. And so the welcoming that we get over there is just incredible. I mean, you know, even for the mechanics and, you know, team managers and everyone that are there and it, it's a different feeling that we don't really feel, you know, I did the Supercross stuff back in like, Oh, two Oh three Oh four Oh five. And it's almost back to like that feeling because, you know, Supercross is like the big show to all of us. 
but that's how these guys get treated over there. And I've been over to Pont Vu and Lake Duquet and a bunch of other beach races over there. And with Jeremy Warnia back when I was helping him and doing, doing stuff with him and can am. And that's how they were all the time, even with him. I mean, the fans were just electric all the time. So I think that's the most exciting part of it for say our U S based riders that get to go over there. And I, I think a kid like Bryce that really loves that electric energy, it, it's something that I would say that there's a chance that you see him go over and race a couple of races, which I, I think would be great for the sport. I do too, because we, we, I don't think we've had an American go to Europe and race ATVs um, other than um, some spotty stuff you know, back at the, the beach races and we're talking yeah. in the nineties. Um, but, but I don't think the, the British championship or the European championship, I don't think any Americans have went over there and raced that I can, that I can remember. Yeah, me either. I mean, I know like Josh Frederick went over and did late to K a couple of times. Uh, Dylan Zimmerman went over and did late to K and then it's, you know, Pond Vu will send it, you know, there'll be an American team. And then Quad Cross of Nations, we, we send an American team. But other than that, it's pretty, it's pretty vague in my memory if it's ever happened to where, you know, they're running one of the, the bigger se- series over there. And, you know, the rumor on the street, and I don't know if it's true or not, but they're talking about combi- combining, combining, sorry, the, a couple of the different series and making it a world championship over there. So that could be a little bit more enticement for some of these bigger name American guys to go over there and, and race that and try to go after a world championship and um, battle it out with Kevin Saar and Dean Dillon and all those guys. Uh, I'd be in for that, you know, uh, That'd be awesome. I, yeah, I, I have uh, not, put this out anywhere, but I don't think that I'll be uh, points racing as a mechanic again. I may do specific spotty stuff, but I I don't think I'll ever be the, 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 the guy um, working on a machine constantly anymore. Uh, I just don't see it in the future. Um, I have too many other irons in the fire with too many different things and age comes into it. I don't know what led you down your path, but I've always loved to be the guy working on the machine and rolling it to the starting line. It just, it, it was just the thing that I wanted to do. And, um, I, I never, I I never seen an end. Um, and until it hit me like a board in the head, uh, that, you know, it's time to sit down. Yeah. It, yeah, I could tell you pretty much the day that I was that the board hit me, and I, and I honestly never thought I'd go to the gate again. And you know, I'm I'm very glad I went with Bryce, and you know, even went to the Wavos race, and you know, there was no real gate where you're down there type of thing. But um, for me, it was you know right after my first kid was born, it just it turned me into a sissy. Honestly, I just I couldn't. I couldn't stand that my hands had every bit of control over that runner's life as as their hands did. And it just it's like something that changed in me and I just I got soft. And so I had to, you know, circumstances happen with where I was working and it pushed me to look for something else. But I never went looking for another mechanic job at that time. Like, I wasn't even on my, it was like, I'll go work construction. I I was done. I was completely signed off. And and that was the last race that year at Loretta's. And we did the side-by-side stuff, which was completely different. And you're in a roll cage with a seatbelt. So it took a lot of that pressure off of me to where it, it didn't bother me the same. It was completely different. And... And at the time I was working for a kid and I just had a kid and, you know, in the past, it was always, you're, you're working for an adult, John, Natalie, Doug, Gus, like these guys are adults, they're professionals. They know exactly what risk they're taking every single time. 
But when you're staring down the eyes of an 11-year-old, you don't know that he understands 100% of the risks that he's taking. And all of a sudden, you get a little soft, and the pressure really starts to sink in. So um, it wasn't a bad thing by any means. It, it definitely brought me into the position that I'm in now and getting to experience so many other things. But uh, nowadays, like I didn't have – I had all the anxiety, all the butterflies that drove me to the starting line every single time that I went to the starting line, the care that I had about that machine, that rider, everything when I was over there with Bryce. So I was really nervous on how the pressure or the anxiety would affect me when we got over there. And it, all that, all those days that I was so nervous and so scared. Once I say I got soft, all went out the door and it was like right back to the old times. It's just like riding a bike. So I can't say that it would never happen again because I, I actually loved it a lot. It's really about getting my body back into the shape to do it again is probably the biggest thing for me. Um, but no, it was, it was really cool and it was exciting. Um, but I, I can relate with you 110% on when it just finally hits you and you're like, I don't have that want to go down there and do that anymore. It's it's the day that I'm loading the truck and I'm like, why am I doing this? <laughs> yeah. You know, because you, you're working so hard to to prep and to, you know, uh, I mean, because I like to, I'm, I'm sure just like you, I like to, to, to know everything front to back. Uh, I mean, I wanted to have the tires. I wanted to have the spare parts. I wanted to have all the stuff so that I knew where everything was you know, where I loaded the trailer and I did all these things and, and it got to a point where, you know, when I have to go sit down because I'm, my shoulders hurt or my legs hurt <laughs> just from loading the trailer, uh, you know, may, may, maybe I ought to rethink this, you know, m maybe there's a better way to do this. And, um, there wasn't, there just for the way I do things there just wasn't. So, uh, it was better to, um, well, there's also another factor in there, and and I'll just be blatantly honest with you. I'd rather spend time with my wife. Um, uh, I recently got married in 18 to the love of my life, and uh, I'd rather be with her than go to the races. No, uh, that's a good reason too. I mean, and you know, I've you know kind of went down the exact same road in a sense. But I'm just limited. I'm limiting myself on how many races I go to or how much, you know, how much travel that I'm doing because I do have, you know, a family and I have, I have three kids. They're all young. They're all in need of a father and a father figure. And my wife needs help. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many kids you have, but I know you, you have at least one because I've just seen her. So you got five. So there you go. You know, every bit of the, the chaos that it, that is instilled upon your wife or your household or whatever it is. So for me, it's trying to find that balance. And, you know, it goes back to us talking about the fishing side of it. So now I'm, yeah, I've turned into a huge family guy. I think that's um, a, a big, big part of trying to make yourself sane in, in old, what we do. I mean, how old are you? I'm 39. So you're just turned 39. Uh, how old's your oldest? Eight. Okay. So you were early 30s uh when you had your first. Um yeah. I was in my early 20s when I had my first child. Um, and uh they kind of grew up with what I did and what I was doing. I opened that door. I'll shut it. Sorry about that. Um <laughs> Valeria, Valeria will at that at, at that edit that part out. Um so I get it. I mean, I, I had no choice but to travel with when when I had little ones at home. Um, I got three of my kids when they were uh, in their 20s. Um, they're my wife's children, uh, but they're they're still okay. they're still needing parenting and and uh, someone solid, like you were saying, to be in their life and, and to help direct them. Their father lives in uh, Guadalajara and I live here and and. I spend a lot of time with two of them and I have six grandkids. Oh, nice. I know. Oh, even I, better. 
and I have three of them that live 19 hours away from me. So it, it's tough. Uh, I don't know if you got to meet my son uh, when we were at, at uh, Sandy, was it Sandy Lake motocross? Sandy Valley. Sandy, Sandy Valley. Valley. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, no, I, I don't did. Know. He'd come yeah. around with you. Yeah. He, um, that was his first day helping with the, with the podcast and with the media portion of the company. And, uh, he didn't have Instagram. Valeria loaded Instagram in his phone that morning and basically talked to him about how it worked. And he come running over to me right before the thing. How do I go live? Because he was <laughs> in the position the way that they broke down the way we broke down the spots, I got stuck on a on a on a camera in one position. Yeah. Valeria ran two other cameras and 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 that left Danny Ray right there at the opening and the beginning of the tires and at the start, so he could go live and he went live on Instagram with no coaching. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, it was it was pretty outstanding. I was pretty excited to to have his help. Um, I oh, think we're going to. I think we're going to see him some more at some of the other events. Um, I know you guys had uh, another place to go or the Fords did. Um, uh, that's why you guys didn't stay for the uh, uh, works race. Uh, Cody got married um, Saturday. Right. This past Saturday. So they were all, I mean, it was basically get out there. Let's do the the Wavos race. And that was kind of the whole, you know, sort of the plan all along. Like when when it started popping up, I shot Bryce a text. I'm like, hey, you want to go? Like it'd be cool. And just, you know, Wes brings a lot. You know, Wes has been around this stuff for a long time and and you know, the history and everything that's around that. And then just some of the names that started popping in there. And I'm like, throw your name in the hat. And so, you know, obviously Wes was, you know, more than excited to have him there. And so, but yeah, it was really one of those things like just get there, race, and then get home. I mean, I I flew out Thursday night and flew back Saturday morning. I mean, I was in and out. I don't I don't know that I was technically in Nevada for twenty four hours total. Um, just kind of <laughs> the way you know. But it's that's you know what I'm saying. Like I I'm willing to do the red eyes and the early morning flights because I want to hurry up and get home as fast as I can so I can be with the wife and the kids. But I, I still want to be at the races. I still want that rush and, and, you know, to see all my friends and, you know, I don't have a whole bunch of friends that I know outside of racing. That's my family. And, you know, I can just walk in, you know, show up to the races and turn my kids loose. I don't, not a worry in the world. Like they're, they go anywhere they want to go. They see whoever they want to see. They all they have friends there and they just go run amok and do whatever they want. I mean, my little guy, he walks over and John Ford scoops him up and they're, they're gone on the four wheeler for a couple hours. Like perfect. You know, gives that, you know, gives mom a break because I, I get a break. I'm traveling or doing my thing, but you know, it's just the, the environment's amazing. But um, anyways, to go back to the way was saying that's, you know, we were in and out of there real quick. We didn't get to go to the works race. I did want to go to the works race. You know, a lot of my roots in ATV racing comes from works. You know, with Josh Fredericks, the Motorworks Can-Am, Warren, you know, Dylan Zimmerman, all these guys. We we were involved so heavily in the works racing for forever. And I'm sure being where it was at, Josh Frederick was probably there. And I didn't see him. No, he didn't come. Uh, I didn't I'm, see him. I thought he would have been at the Huevos race. And so I was really excited because it's been a lot of years since I got to see Josh. I actually haven't seen Josh since he got hurt. Um, I've, I've talked to him multiple times, but I haven't got to see him. And we were super close, you know, back in the Can-Am days. So, you know, some of those guys, it's, they're still friends, even though you don't talk every day or whatever. And when you see him, it's like you never miss a beat. So we got to see a lot of guys out there. And obviously, you know, the racing was awesome. I mean, I think a lot of people watched. I've heard from everyone I talked to that they thought the racing was really cool and, and really exciting. And, you know, congratulations to Bryce, like pulls that off. Um, for me, I wanted Bryce and Joel in the finals, obviously. 
to, you know, Impact Solution Nelco Riders. And then to have Natalie there and the history that I have with John Natalie and so many years of working together and, you know, just one of my best friends. And we, we talk weekly, if not at times daily, and we're, we're always shooting the crap back and forth. And he said, he's going to come out and race. And I'm like, all right, well, when are you going to ride? He said, well, I called John and I'm going to ride Bryce's practice bike. And I'm like, have you ever rode a YFZ 450R? And he's like, nope, I'm not even sure I ever sat on one. I'm like, and you're just going to show up off the couch and ride this thing. And he's like, yeah, I don't see why not. Okay. So he rode at Breezewood up in PA for about 15 minutes a Saturday before and showed up out there and sat on Bryce's quad. And I did my best to have his levers and shifter and brake pedal and everything adjusted before he got there. And I think I, I think I got it all, but the shifter. And it's been 10 years since I wrenched on a bike for John. So I thought that was kind of cool. It was like almost a challenge to me. I sat on the bike. I'm like, oh, I got to move this, move this. And he should be pretty good. And he sat on it. He's like, pretty dang close. Shifter and nerf net's a little tight. All right. And then we never changed a thing the rest of the night. And so, you know, perfect world. If we could have had Joel, Bryce, and John in the final three, I think it would have been, you know, an amazing night for me, obviously. But Walker rode great and ended up, you know, edging John out there at the end. So, uh, you know, and to get it down to Bryce and Joel in the final, for me, it was just like, it, it's cool. Either way it goes. And, you know, I work with Joel very closely and Bryce very closely. Um, Bryce asked me to come out there with him and, and be there. So it was really cool for for Bryce to get the win and, you know, to get to take those pictures and, that's something I haven't done in my career with racing is really embrace these moments. And so I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to take the extra 30 seconds to stop and take a picture with your number one finger or the number one player, the big check or, you know, whatever it is. I, there's so many accomplishments that I've gotten to be a part of in the 25 years in motorsports that I've done and I've never taken the time until probably this year now to really embrace those moments and, and get a keepsake or whatever it is. You know, this is probably one of the coolest things I have. I don't know. Bryce Ford gave me his helmet from um, the Texas national this year. And I think that it was, um, you know, I have jerseys. I have John's championship Jersey. I have the last Jersey that Doug Gus ever won in. And um, this helmet right here means a lot to me. It, it was huge. And I think that's, you know, not because Bryce gave me his helmet, but I think it shows like how close Bryce and I are and that he, I just, I was a Cowboys fan, like big time growing up and his whole kit that he had there was cool. And I just kept going like that helmet would look cool on my wall. Like the helmet's cool. Never did I ever think. And then he come over Saturday night after the race, it's like here and he had it all signed. He signed an advisor and stuff. I'm like, dude, that's big. Like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that is. Uh, I I feel you because uh, I've gotten to experience some pretty cool stuff in my day. And no, we never did take the time to enjoy it. Um, a lot, large portion of it wasn't readily available cameras like there are today. And there may be some yeah. pictures of some things that are out there, but. Uh, when I was with Eichner, we were racing all the time and I was b building a bike or prepping a bike or, uh, you know, traveling back from somewhere. You know, you had to get in the car, you had to go. You didn't have time to, you know, shoot the shit or go to dinner with, with all the people after the race. Y you had to go. And yeah. um, if I could pass on anything to any up and comer. That's what I would pass on is enjoy those moments because there may not be another one. Yeah. You're not, you're not guaranteed to win another race. You're not guaranteed to win another championship. You, you grasp that moment, enjoy it. And, and I mean, I'm don't say, you know, stake your whole career on it, but, but take yeah. the, take that day, you know, tomorrow will come. 
take that day yeah. and enjoy it because, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they, they just, I can remember those days, but I can't, uh, I don't have anything to show for them. Yeah. You know? And I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and I, I've been saying it a lot lately or like this last year or even the year before, like, you know, these guys, they, they hit career milestones or, you know, they win a race and they, you know, never won or they win a championship. And it's been, been a while since they won a championship or, you know, you, you're on the winning quad cross nations team. And, you know, basically that's a win, whatever it is, like you guys step back and think about it a little bit and, and it doesn't have to be winning a race, but it's just the accomplishments that you've gained or that you've learned or developed or had over time. Like, enjoy those little moments because before before you know it it that day is over and you've moved on and your your next goals in front of you and all you do is have the memories which is why we do all this stuff but to have that picture to hang on a wall when you get to buy your first house or whatever it is is something huge i mean there's a lot of keepsakes that i wish i had to be able to put in my office or put in my garage or whatever it is that I, you can kind of maybe go back and remake them now with today's technology or whatever, but it's not the same as if it's like right then real life. You know, I, I've always been a number plate guy. So I do have a pretty solid collection of number plates and every one of them, at least on the backside tells you, you know, what race it was, what year it was, what rider it was or whatever. So one day when I get the time to sit down and put all that together, I will have a pretty cool keepsake collection of different riders that I've worked for and races that we've won and things like that. I can put all together, but yeah, exactly. Like you said, embrace the moment because you may not get to win that next race or you may not hit your next goal. And that's not being negative. It's just why we go racing. We don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah. You take a guy like Chad, He's won eight national titles and it's an uphill battle for him to win a ninth. Doesn't mean he won't, but just the odds are stacked against him. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Joel, Joel is just a man on a mission. And then obviously you have the guys that are right behind those guys that want to knock them off their pedestal so bad that they can taste it. And they're working you know, as hard as they can and they're maturing year by year, you know, every year, you know, I've said it for years in ATV racing, you don't just show up as an 18 year old kid and start winning, you know, now don't get me wrong. Joel is an exception. Joel did start winning in his rookie year, but it's not like the dirt bike world where you get the 17, 18 year old kids winning races. And I don't know what the difference is if it's, because there's more moving parts, there's just different elements to ATV racing, but it's not something you don't start winning, at least in the past, you don't start winning until not later in your career, but as you mature, you know, and so sometimes that maturing age is 23, 24, 25 years old. We've seen it with Chad, you know, it took Joel for what, 2011, six years before Joel won his first championship. And it took him another few years before he won his next championship. You know, those championships aren't easy to come by. And it's exactly the position that Chad's in right now. He's been so dominant for so many years. And he's had the recipe to be able to win championships. And he still does. There's no doubt he's, you know, him and Joel are are the guys but these kids i say kids these other riders that are third fourth fifth sixth seventh they're all chomping at the bit they want to get up there and do it and that's what's going to keep joel and chad on their toes and and make it even harder for them to continue to push and and do what they're doing i agree um i i we've talked about bryce and we've talked about his uh, fact that he's a comer. Um, I've talked to Brandon Hogue and watched video on him and Max Lindquist. I would have to say that those three young writers, 
Um, and I'm not trying to slight any of anybody else, but the, out of the young writers and Nick Janus is not one of the young writers. He's not old, but he's, he's maturing into the point where he's going to be the guy that puts the hurt on the young guy to take that third spot. They're going to have to get by him first. But if you look at the young guys coming, and there is a reason why I mentioned Nick, because I really like that guy. You know, I like his spunk and his fire. Um, and I don't want him to think that I'm slighting him in any way. Um, but Brandon and Max and Bryce, those th- th- there's some fire right there. Yeah, I mean, those three, we, it's no secret. I mean, they're they're definitely the, like you said, the comers. And, you know, yeah, they got guys like Nick Chanusa and Jeffrey Estrelli that are going to stand in their way. And and Brandon Hogue is, Brandon's, what, a year before Bryce in the pro class. And then it was Max. And those guys are, you know, they're all kind of that same group. It's Brandon, Max, Bryce. You know, they're all moving and trying to get to the to that front of the pack. And every every one of them has more than the capability of doing it. You know, but they have some very, very stiff competition in the likes of, say, Rastrelli and um, Nick Janusa. I mean, those guys, you, you watch Rastrelli, uh, and I, obviously I, w- I work with Nick and Jeffrey, and but you watch Rastrelli ride, and he has the charisma of the Young Bucks. You know, his style, the way he rides. But then you watch sometimes when he gets around some of those, some of the younger kids, his veteran skill set or his veteran mind comes into play. And I've watched him do some stuff and you're just like, holy crap, like I seen it coming. But some of the younger guys that haven't don't have the same race craft yet didn't even see it coming. And yeah. and then boom, he's he's by him or you know, he can tell from you know, five, six bike lengths behind, like he already knows in his head, like I'm going to get him. You know, I just got to hit a couple marks and I'm going to, I'm going to go right by him. Like he can tell early and and he'll tell me these things just in, in conversation when we talk. And, you know, he may think it goes in, goes in one ear, not the other, but it's not that it's, I know exactly what he's saying because I can see it majority of the time. And then there's weekends when I'm like, what are you doing? Like you should be faster than this guy, or or you shouldn't have got past, or you shouldn't have made this a mistake. Like you're too much of a veteran to do those things. But again, it's it goes back to the same that I say all the time. That's why we go racing. We don't know what's going to happen. If we could predict what was going to happen, then we wouldn't go racing anymore. It wouldn't be any fun. Right. I mean, when we were when we were streaming live, and you go back and you read the uh, comments. Uh, Joel's going to win. Joel's going to win. Joel's going to win. And nobody, nobody picked anybody else. You know, they said, Oh, I'd like to see so-and-so win, or I'd like to see Bryce win, but they didn't pick them, you know? And there was a couple of people that had to tally pick, which well, I thought yeah. was really cool. Cause he looked really good. Well, when, uh, when Danny was live streaming, he, did it right, right in practice before they did the modification on the tires before yeah. they, before they adjusted those. And Natalie was the only one to get over them. <laughs> and you're, yeah. you're thinking, you're thinking, well, leave it alone and let, let, let them catch up to the old Wiley veteran and see if they can do this, you know? And uh, I think Walker probably would have, and maybe um and, and and maybe a couple others, but um that would have been a struggle if they wouldn't have put that dirt there. Oh yeah. And I and it was a struggle to the point where with how short of a race it was, there wouldn't have been possibly a whole lot of racing. I mean, we we seen, mm-hmm. I mean, I think I think I'd say what I mean, and you would know too, you were you were standing right there with us. Uh, well, you were looking right through a lens with us, but um, right. 
would you say 90% of the races that night were decided on one side or the other of that incurable cross section? Yes. Yes. And, it, and it's funny. We, we mentioned like John was one, you know, one of the best through the tire section all night. And what literally eliminated him was the quote unquote <laughs> easy side of the tires. And I, I, after the race, I looked at him, I said, you were literally arguably the best through the tire section all night. And you go to the easy side, you had it lined up to make the pass on Walker. We know, or, you know, I, I feel our gut, like he would, he was going to make it happen either right there through that section. If he would have made it clean or he would have made a pass on the motocross section. And I'm like, what happened? It was the easy side. And it's, pretty simple to see what happened he just lost just a little bit of traction and didn't get the pop and bumper hit and feet come off and that was it for you know that's all you had to do and when you're racing against a guy like Walker Fowler there's um you can't make a mistake like that and you know we've seen it come down you know the next race with Joel and Bryce I mean they both made some crazy mistakes through that section and you know one just held on a little little bit more than the other or you know, one mistake was a little smaller than the other was a mistake, and that's what ended up winning the race. So, you know, like I said, ninety percent of the races were done and and uh, won and lost in that section. I would say. I haven't got to talk to Joel, but I would assume, based on what I saw, that he he just rushed it just a hair, approaching that 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 section, and that's what lost him is is he was racing and instead of being just a little more patient uh like he had been earlier in the day he he made the mistake didn't get the front end up high enough and, and it caught him on the tire and that gave bryce the opening and then bryce gets excited and hits it super hard and almost throws himself on the ground oh it was it was crazy i mean it was like you know, just to hear the crowd, which was, I think that was cool. You know, just, oh, oh, oh. And then, you know, <laughs> you don't know because you're running, you know, sort of to the other side to see, you know, I can never, I never really got in a position to where I could just watch the entire Enduro cross section. I could see them go through about three quarters of it or so. And then you would kind of run on the other side of that hill that we were all standing on and watch them come back down the next moto section. and. I mean, I, I had seen Joel mess up and then I seen Bryce's feet come off, but he stayed on the bike. And so I knew Joel was going to be real close. I, I, I didn't even know Joel actually came off the bike until I seen the video the next day. Even that night, I, I had no idea that Joel actually ended up coming off the bike. And so like I ran across the other side to see who was going to come up over the hill because I figured they were still going to be nose to tail. Is that when Joel first hit it, he didn't come off the bike. And when Bryce come out, and I was like, where's Joel? Holy crap. Like, what happened? And then here come Joel up over. And obviously, at that point, he knew, you know, and he wasn't in a mad panic anymore. There was only so much on a moto track like that, that, you know, so much time he was going to actually be able to make up. And so, you know, it, it is what it is. And, but yeah. Um, I, I would agree with you 110%. It was just a little bit rushed and it just, and I think that's exactly like what we were saying with John, like he just rushed a little bit, lost a little bit of traction, went a little too hard and didn't get it enough. And the, the decision maker, if we, if we ever do that race again, they knew Wes needs to have a sign made across that, the decision maker, cause that's exactly what it ended up being. Oh yes. It was, it was incredible. I think it was an amazing event the sport needed something like that. It needed to be brought together in, you know, the East, the West, the North, the South, whatever. Um, you had realistically five different disciplines at that race. Um, Roberto is a desert racer and races off-road. Uh, Riley is a TT guy that's raced some motocross. And then you have the woods racers and the motocross guys. And, you know, then you have uh, uh, Logan Huff, who's a, a an officer. He's desert raced. He's done some wood stuff. So you, you had a wide variety of people doing a, a, a multitude of different things. And um, 
I would love to see a series where you could bring all those different guys together. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, the one guy that we didn't get to see was Bo. You know, it would have been cool to see Bo Barron there. Um, I mean, there's numerous guys I would have loved to have seen, seen there, but, you know, I think if it would have been in its original location, I think Bo would have raced. But at the same time, Bo had a lot on the line um, that weekend with at the works race and stuff. So I, I've known Bo for many, many years. I knew Bo before. Heck, I think I knew Bo before he ever even raced a quad. He was a dirt bike racer and his brother-in-law lived with me. Like the randomest thing in the world. And then... I got my job at Suzuki and Bo somehow ended up on a quad and the first quad they started riding was an LTR. And so Mikey, his brother-in-law would be calling me like, Hey, what, what do we do here? What do we do with this? What do we do? And then here we go. You know, I think Bo's the winningest works racer ever. And, you know, he's still winning championships and winning races on a consistent basis. So um, he would have been a cool aspect and he rips on a moto track. You know, we've seen him come out and race the ATV Moto, and he's done very well. So, uh, bummed that I didn't, I didn't even actually get to see him. And so I was kind of bummed on that, but um, completely understood. And I and I think there would have been more spectators, and, and you could tell me if you agree. If it would have been in the original location, I think with the adversity on what was going on, we lost a bit of our spectators that we would have had if it would have stayed. But there was still a really good spectator turnout. The event was still really cool. It was still ran well for the location change and for West to pull all that off in like 24 hours. You know, I, I got to give them, um, you know, a, a nod of the hat to be able to pull it off. Yes, I think that uh, we would have had more spectators in the original location. Um, there's a lot more to that conversation that I'm not at liberty to go into and I don't really want to. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. West, did great job. West did a great job. And um, the people we were, when we showed up there, um, I tried to get there earlier than I did. But when we showed up there, you know, we went jumped right in the back of the truck, drove over and we're helping him throw tires. You know, my son was moving uh, logs with him and everything uh, while I was ever talking, you know, socializing. I guess you might say. And, uh, but it, it was, it was outstanding for the industry. And yeah, I think it was great. Uh, I hope we get to do it again uh, sooner than later. And um, maybe we can move it around, make it a more centralized place. So it's not quite so far for the East guys to go um, and, and, and make it a, a venue all on its own. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. And I, and I think there's plenty of uh, locations that it could be brought to that makes it more centralized for everybody. Or, you know, we do it towards the east one year and we do it towards the west one year. And, you know, I think you bring a different element of the dirt out there. The East Coast guys aren't, you know, super used to, say, that dirt. Um, as soon as I had heard that there was maybe – you know, a location switch or something like that. I called it, you know, I said, they're going to go to Sandy Valley MX. I Googled it on my phone real quick because I had been there a million times when I worked for the team in Vegas. We used to go practice there all the time, but I wasn't sure if it was still there. And so I'm like, before I say anything to like my circle of people, I'm going to Google it real quick. And yep, still there open from nine to five, blah, blah, blah. You know, the hours were still there on Google maps. And so I'm like, it's going to Sandy Valley MX. I'm like, here's the address. Just plan on going there. Yeah, that's where we're going to go. And lo and behold, you know, they re they release it and that's where it was. And everyone's like, how did you know that? I'm like, I just know the locations. I lived in Vegas and I know the locations of where Prim's at, where Vegas is at, and where this motocross track is at. And I knew it would be available or figured it'd be available. It just kind of all the, all the arrows pointed that direction. Um, so back to, you know, the East Coast guys don't really know that soil. And and what it was going to develop into, and if we bring a lot of the West Coast guys out of the East, you know they're going to have to deal with that too. And you know maybe we throw a TT section in there for the TT guys. You know, Brad rode awesome; he held his own incredibly. Uh, I thought he was pretty fast. 
he I mean, was I really, really fast. Yeah. Which he's rode a lot of moto and he was a top three, like a consistent podium guy in pro am a few years back. So I was never, it never even crossed my mind that he was going to be like way off or something like that. I knew and to be honest, when Bryce drew him in the first round with the way time qualifying went, I was like, don't, don't take it easy. Like you need to go ride because that dude's fast. And right. with the way the track was and his corner speed so good. I like, and I mean, just his bike control, obviously from doing the flat track PT stuff, I knew he was gonna be tough and he was on a rocket too. So it, it worked out cool and it was good to see him, you know, just jump in there and he hadn't been riding moto in a while. So it was good to see. Right. I'm glad the moto track wasn't so demanding. I mean, it was, it was a smooth, nice, yeah. not, not real rough, not real, not super moto -y. you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and it worked out good because it was smooth and, you know, had some cool jumps on it and it was fast. So I think it, you know, I think it lent it, lent its hand to the moto guys, obviously, but it wasn't just like this, red bud nasty rough crazy track to where you know a moto setup that you're used to developing and, and putting on your machine is gonna lend a huge hand to it right right i think the off-road guys would have liked it to have been a little more rougher than yeah. than it was but it was still a great show and it was a great event. And, and I think uh, we can't thank Wes and, and his group enough for uh, what they did for us. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad to be there and be a part of it. It's one of those things that, you know, that night on the way back to the hotel to kind of gather our stuff to get ready to go to the airport the next day. It was, you know, we, we went to IHOP and it was, let, let's take this moment in. And, you know, I, and I think, you know, for for Bryce, you know, with the way Quad Cross and Nations went, and then with the Wavos race, I, I think it's just a a ball of steam in his corner, just rolling the right direction. And I I expect that to be you know huge in his confidence and momentum, you know, moving forward. And he embraced it, which I thought was really cool. It was fun to see him like actually celebrate, and he was so excited. And I, when we sat back and, you know, we drove back to the hotel and we were all filthy, you know, obviously the dust and, and the, the wind out there just, you know, you're just caked. So we ended up going to IHOP that night and getting some, some late night food. And it was just cool to kind of sit back and think about it. Like, wow, like what a year it, it, it's been and so many awesome experiences this year. And, you know, from Joel, obviously winning. The ATV MX Pro Championship, you know, Dane Molander, he secured the Pro-Am Championship, Bryce and Neil in cross country, Hannah Hunter and WM or WXC in cross country, Quad Cross and Nations and the Wavos thing. I think um, for me, I, I don't know that it could have been much better of a year, honestly. It, it was really cool. It sounds like a pretty amazing year. You know, it's one of those ones that go down in the history book or in, in your own little catalog that you always <laughs> think about, you know? Yeah. I don't know that it means anything to anyone else, but I can tell you trying to think about things in a deeper and and different way and embrace them. It, it's definitely one of those things I sat back and I was like, wow, like what a year. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, it is brother. It is. Casey, I want to thank you so much for coming on ATV Talk and spending some time with us. Um, as not always, but usually uh, when I didn't get all the information that I wanted and maybe didn't go down some of the avenues of your life and your career that I wanted to, I want to extend the invitation to have you come back and we can cover some more about you at a, at a later date. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, again, we went down so many rabbit holes already and we could we could go down a whole lot more and we could, you know, from Baja and, you know, you've probably forgotten more about Baja than I know, but I've, I've gotten to be down there and, and won, you know, all the Baja races on the ATV side. So I'd love to share some of that stuff and just go through it and we'll, we'll have to set some time apart or side again and, you know, chat it up for another hour and a half or so. Cause we, I'm sure we could turn this into a couple hour show. 
real quick. We, we could, we could. And- the team here at ATV Talk would love your feedback. Please email us at hello at ATVTalkPodcast.com. If you're in need of a consultation for your current racing program, a custom ATV, or an industry guest speaker, I have the company for you. Duncan Technologies International Inc. offers host, MC, and guest speaking services at events. Builds custom ATVs for recreational riding or racing around the world. And they offer consulting services for professional teams or individual racers. Send inquiries to Duncan Tech International at gmail.com or call 619-716-1532 for more information. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, don't forget to share us with your family and friends. The podcast is available on all streaming platforms and you can find us on social media as ATV Talk Podcast. We're on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, Rumble, and Twitter. 